Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 345 session. Today, we're introducing Quiltree and Heart Drum, and Joanna is going to introduce everybody. Thank you. You're going to have to unmute. Oh, do it. I got you. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joanna Belfer with Bel Canto Books in Long Beach, California. And I'm very excited to um, join you for this introduction to Heart Drum, um, HarperCollins' new native-focused imprint, which launches in 2021, so just around the corner. Um, today, we are joined by Heart Drum co-founders Rosemary Brosnan and Cynthia Leitich smith as well as authors Christine Day, Don Quigley, and Brian Young. So I'll introduce each of one of them, and then they'll have an opportunity to talk about their work and then at the end, we'll bring in Rosemary for a discussion. So to start, we'll start with Christine Day, um, who is an enrolled citizen of the Upper Skagit tribe. Her debut novel, I Can Make This Promise, was a best book of the year. And Christine's new book, The Sea in Winter, comes out January 5th, 2021. Go ahead, Christine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joanna. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Christine. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Upper Skagit Tribe. And um, this is my second book, The Sea in Winter. Um, if you are familiar with my first book, I can make this promise. I think The Sea in Winter is very similar in that this is a really uh, kind of a quieter coming of age story. It follows a young girl named Maisie who is recovering in the aftermath of a knee injury. And she is a serious young ballet student. And um, she, this injury has taken her away from the studio and away from her closest friends for several months by the time this book begins. And we kind of follow her on her journey as um, she continues to heal and sort of turn towards her family and her loved ones to sort of help her through this transition period that she's in. And um, yeah, it all sort of culminates with a midwinter road trip with her family to the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. And in a nutshell, that's what this book is about. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. And um, Valentina dropped a link in the chat to request a galley. So just the beautiful cover and um, you can just sign up there to check that out. Um, next, we have Don Quigley, who is a citizen of the Turtle, Band, Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe, North Dakota. Her debut YA novel, Apple in the Middle, was an awarded an American Indian Youth Literature Honor. And Don's new chapter book, Jojo McCoons, comes out May 11, 2021. Go ahead, Don. Bonjour, I mean, everybody. I, um... I'm so excited to be here. I'm in Minnesota right now, home. And so please excuse my Minnesota accent. I don't know when it comes out. <laughs> but um, anyway, I'm so thrilled to be a part of the Hard Drum family. Um, it's been a journey, just like every author. But I'm so excited for the support, the community, um, and for everybody to get to see Jojo McCoons um, in the spring. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then we have Brian Young, who is an author, filmmaker, and an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, a healer of the water monster, healer of the water monster. His debut novel comes out May 11th, 2021. Oh man, it sounds so scary when you actually have the date, because <laughs> it's like so final and real. <laughs> but hi everyone, Yate, uh, Brian Young, Brooklyn Hi everyone, my name is Brian Young. I am Red Running Into Water Clan, born for the Tango People Clan. My maternal grandfather's clan is Saltwater People Clan, and my paternal grandfather's clan is Bitterwater People Clan. I currently live in Brooklyn, but am from the Fort Defiance and Sawmill, Arizona area. Um, yeah, Healer of the Water Monster is about a young Navajo boy named Nathan who has grown up around electronics and running water, and he spends his summer with his um, grandmother, who he calls Nolly, 
on the Navajo Reservation who lives uh, traditionally without running water or electricity, and he comes across a sick water monster, um, one of the beings from my tribe's uh, creation story. Who is sick? And he has to heal him. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Brian. And then we have Cynthia Leitich Smith, who is an enrolled member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. She is a best selling author. She's co founder of Heart Drum and the editor of Ancestor Approved Intertribal Stories for Kids, Oops. a collection of intersecting stories um, that are all set at the same powwow, and that comes out February 2021. Mata, thank you, SJ. It's, it's a great honor to be here. We are so grateful that you have invited us into your community to talk about books and our children. Um, as mentioned, my name is Cynthia Lydic Smith. I'm a woman of the Wind Clan, Chicota Tribal Town, and the Muscogee Creek Nation of Old Mulgee, Oklahoma. We're very friendly folks and fry practically all of our food. I'm really excited to be sharing Ancestor Approved with young readers, with all of you who are such great champions for them. It's an exciting book because it is in itself very community based. It's about a coming together of authors poets and an illustrator to bring forth a sort of wholly three-dimensional experience. The powwow setting is a venue in which all of our young heroes intersect, some of them connect, and I think it's a wonderful showcase of different voices, some of which are very well established, like Joseph Bruchat, some of which are very new, like Brian's. He, he actually has two stories in the collection and they are absolutely brilliant. In fact, all of our Heart Drum authors who are here today are featured in the collection. So it, it, it's very exciting to me because I think it is in some ways indicative of this new wellspring of exciting talent and cooperative um, creativity that's really happening in Native Kid Lit today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And then lastly, we have Ro Rosemary Brosnan. She's been at HarperCollins since 1999. And in addition to running Cool Tree Books, Rosemary is the co-founder of Heart Drum Imprint um, with Cynthia. And um, so just want to give Rosemary a quick moment to introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having us. I'm very, very excited. Um, this is our first uh, Heart Drum event where we're all getting together and it's really just such an honor for me. Um, Cynthia will be able to tell you a little bit about the um, how the idea came up for the imprint and um, it's just been such a highlight of of the year for me. It's it's been amazing. So thanks. It's good to be here. Thank you. And so Cynthia, if we can jump on into that conversation, where did you, um, you know, where did this idea come from to start a new imprint um, focused on uh, Native writers? The idea was really a gift. I'm sure you're all familiar with author Ellen O, who is a remarkable storyteller, and also the work that she's done along with her co-founders at the nonprofit organization, We Need Diverse Books. Ellen approached me a couple of years ago and suggested that I might be a person who could help bring a native imprint to a major publisher. And at first I, I, I felt a bit reluctant because it seemed like such a big dream. Um, but you know, she is such a force in the universe and so positive and affirming. And she pointed out that because I publish across age markets, genres and formats, picture book, middle grade, YA, chapter books, fiction, nonfiction, fantastical poetry, a little bit of everything, and because I'm a writing teacher that I might be someone who could bring together uh, writers and writer illustrators and connect illustrators to them in a way that would be nurturing and provide community and conversation. It was always a bit more um, broad based than the imprint itself. There's also an educational and community support component of it wherein we're doing workshops generously funded by Harper Children's to develop new talent as well as publishing stories both by established names and new ones. So with Ellen's suggestion in mind, I approached Rosemary. I've had a long history with her. We first began working together when I was very new in the industry and had so much to learn and I knew what a wonderful teacher she was, how incredibly nurturing and what, I mean, literally one of the great legendary editors working today. But more than that, she was someone I thought that I could trust with my community, with my cousins. 
as they were embarking and continuing on their creative journey. So I reached out to her and she was infinitely enthusiastic and we began taking pragmatic steps to make this happen. So it's been, it feels like both sort of a bit of a long story, but also it only seems like yesterday. And I'm, I'm just really excited about everyone we've connected with and the characters and narratives that we're gonna be bringing forth to young readers. That's amazing. And then um, for the authors, I know um, uh, several of you, this is your second book or, or you know, many books, I think for Cynthia, um, but I know for Brian, this is your very first uh, novel. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about that experience and um, obviously congratulations um, and ask you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, where you got the idea for the, the book um, and what it was like to work with Heartdrum. Sure. Um... I actually think there was someone asking to share the cover and is it okay if I do a share screen and show the book cover um, virtually? <laughs> yes, please. Awesome. All right. So here is my wonderful, oh, cool. beautiful uh, book cover. I'm so proud of it. Um, painted by Shanta Begay. And I just want to take a moment to recognize that it's not every day you have a Navajo author with a Navajo painter to make a cover for Navajo kids. It's, it's I think, the first of its kind. I want to say it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my initial inspiration for Healer of the Water Monster was actually a dream that I had about six years ago. Um, and it's a very powerful dream. And in it, there was a young boy who was playing video games and texting his friends on a smartphone. And then something compelled him to run into the desert. And he met up with a, a little lizard and the boy and the lizard started to sing a song and then it started raining in the desert. And that image just stuck with me for months after I had the dream of a modern kid, you know, surrounded by electronics and then meeting up with a, what I assumed to be a holy being from my people's creation story that I started imagining who this kid was and why he needed to be there to help the lizard sing down the rain. And that was the initial impetus, the initial inspiration, but the long-term reason why I stuck with the story for that many years was that there are no books that have Navajo children as a protagonist, not when I was growing up and to my knowledge, not now. So that lack of visibility and representation uh, was what kept me working on Healer of the Water Monsters for these many years. And I'm still pretty new to the publishing industry, but my work with uh, Heart Drum has been nothing but positivity. <laughs> I feel that with um, the collaborations I'm having with other Native authors and my wonderful editor, that I'm definitely growing and recognizing my weaknesses as a writer and addressing and hopefully getting stronger as a writer. Um, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> awesome, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing that cover, that's spectacular. I think that's um, such a, a tremendous achievement to not only bring your, your work to the world, but also to be able to share um, an art, a fellow artist's work um, on the cover. So that's super exciting. Um, I also want to ask kind of the same question um, to Christine about, um, I know that this is your second novel, um, what has that experience been for you to, you know, get, have the excitement of the first one down and, and then moving on to now you're, you're an established writer and, and is that different um, when you're writing the second book um, as opposed to the first? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I will say that writing my second published book was a much more difficult process than writing the first um, because now when once you have you've made it you've got your first book deal and you're starting to sort of build this team with your agent and your editor and all these people that you really really like a lot and i was just um so scared of disappointing them <laughs> and also of uh you know you're sort of developing continuing to develop your voice and um still trying to figure out what are the types of stories that are that I feel are really um, important and sort of right for me to tell and um, what I feel most sort of equipped to tell. So um, I will say that 
just like with my first book, which was very much inspired by uh, some of my own experiences and my family's history and um, a lot of sort of broader histories that through my education and through my sort of upbringing with different mentors and things I uh, learned a lot about. I wanted to continue to sort of, um, you know, draw inspiration from a personal place, but I did so with this one in a way that was actually uh, sometimes even harder than, than with my first book, I think. So, um, yeah, it was definitely just a, uh, it was a, a really, really challenging experience, but it was so rewarding. And um, I'm really proud of my second book. And um, even though, you know, dealing with all that imposter syndrome and all the kind of, uh, also having to write a book much faster too. That's the other thing is that all of a sudden I had a deadline and I was sort of, you know, working really like Rosemary, when she saw my first book, I had already, you know, been working on it for a couple years. <laughs> and I had like, you know, gone through so many different drafts of it. And then going from that to now it was like I was having conversations with her about it when it was still very early in the process and I still didn't actually know what I was doing but I was trying to make it seem like I knew what I was doing <laughs> and that was like that was uh you know I learned a lot from it and I think that we just continue to work so well together and I'm so grateful to have her and to also have Susie my agent because they've just been like guiding lights for me through this whole process and it's really really wonderful to just feel like I can trust them so much and be so vulnerable with them. And then that sort of enables me to then continue to push myself creatively and uh, come up with what I'm very proud of as my second book. Awesome. Congratulations. I know that that's, I think that's always the scary thing. If you, you know, you do something that's successful, you're everybody's like, oh, that's great. And then you're like, oh crap, now people expect me to do it again. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, I uh, wanted to ask that question lastly of Dawn, because I know that your book is actually um, a chapter book. So it's, it's meant to be um, the first in a series of books. And does that change how, you know, how you envision, how you get down to writing and how, then how do you envision, you know, how the book is going to con continue and how the characters will live on? Yeah, so um, so the the first book in the series is Jojo McCoons, um, and they used to be best friend, and so um, it's really interesting. That's actually my third book, but it's my first book. Um, uh, when I had an agent, and then of course with a heart drum, and it you know my writing. I, I was a teacher for eighteen years, and now I'm a, a professor in a higher ed. And I really started writing when, um, you know, the universe, <laughs> the creator is interesting. I, I, I started to lose my ability to have my super loud teacher voice. And so I really had to turn inward and I, I found my, vo my voice through writing. And so um, years and years ago, I sent an email to, um, to Cynthia's author website and she has just been, she was my virtual mentor for years, encouraging me to get my first book, um, Apple in the Middle, published. And, you know, back then, so I think um, I started setting it out in 2014. And um, it's interesting, I think uh, that's why Heart Drum is so amazing. I know I'm getting off, off topic a little bit, but I'm trying to, you know, Native people, we kind of will get to the point, but it takes a while. <laughs> um, so uh small presses small indie presses were really um they were interested in publishing that and so that's that's how i got my first one published and then i did a um a picture book nonfiction picture book with scholastic native american heroes and then i got an agent and i had this great chapter book series really was born out of rejection and with that rejection, it was Sim's encouragement, like she gives to all of us. She said, I wonder if you've ever thought about writing a chapter book series. And I said, I can't write a chapter book series. 
can I? You know? And so I started thinking about it. And pretty soon this little Jojo uh, first grader started walking around in my mind. And so Jojo is very unique. So she's an Indigenous girl, contemporary. And I really describe the book and the series as um, a, a, an Indigenous modern day take of Judy B. Jones, but on the res. <laughs> and so um, it's just been great. I've had, there's been such great support with, um, with Cynthia, of course, and then Rosemary. I feel um, maybe like Brian as, I, I feel like a new, op, a new author and I feel like I'm just getting so much education and, and their comments and their suggestions. It's, it's really been great. Um, and not only that, but just the, this aspect of um, relationship is so important in native communities. And now Native Kidlet, it's just like my other family. And I can't wait to get to know Christine and Brian even more. And Brian, I think we have the same um, month that we are, our book birthday month, so. <laughs> well, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and then I wanted to ask this question for um, Cynthia and Rosemary um, in terms of, you know, because we've, we've been hearing the authors talk about what um, what a special um, treat it's been to work with you both on their books. Um, and so just was curious if you can talk a little bit more about being on the other side of, of the, the table, so to speak, and being the author and being the person who's, you know, out there acquiring books, looking for authors. What is that like? It's, it's a lot of fun. You know, I, I mentioned that I've been a writing teacher. I'm on the MFA faculty at Vermont College of Fine Arts. And right now, um, my students are Indigenous. Uh, those that just happen to be assigned to me, or perhaps they put me down with that in mind, who knows. But I've also taught workshops at Highlights Foundation and Whiffer and SCBWIs. It was really um, a workshop that Dawn was at called Loon Song that created the pivot in my mind when I went from thinking maybe about the imprint to thinking, yes, let's absolutely do this. And it was because I was surrounded by all of these talented, joyful, um, creative Native voices. And I thought there, there just need to be more ways for them to reach a wider community. And there needs to be more of an emphasis on Native literary traditions and storytelling structures that might not necessarily be recognized by someone who wasn't familiar with them uh, or might um, struggle in some ways to be bridged to a mainstream audience with someone who didn't necessarily have a broader understanding of children's literature. So I try to be that in some ways. I, I try to be the bridge and to have the opportunity to give all of that encouragement um, one on one to a student is deeply rewarding to be able to take it the next step and pass that manuscript on for serious consideration for acquisitions, that's really exciting. And it's where we need to go. We need to see a real increase um, in, in the stories and voices that are being published, both intertribally and across intersections. There's a lot of diversity within each Native nation and in terms of various identity elements, and those need to be reflected too. So th those were all kind of things. It's it's nice to be able to, as I say, take that extra step. And then, you know, beyond that, I would say what really makes me happy is that it, it is kind of a j game changer in terms of the conversation. I think that when we made the statement that we are dedicated to Native voices, it made people sit up and take notice. Um, it might make bookstores look at their collections and think, oh, what, what, what voices really are we featuring here? How do we include them in a lot of different conversations that go beyond Native Heritage Month or Indigenous Peoples Day? Where else can they fit in? And publishing a wide range of books does that because you can connect them to other subject matter and fresh new readers. Thank you for saying that. Rosemary, did you want to talk about what it's been like for you as the, the editor? Um, I've had a long career and it really is one of the biggest highlights of my career, I have to say. Um, when Cynthia came to me, she wrote an email asking about the idea of an imprint. And um, I sent it to Suzanne Murphy, who's our president and publisher. I ran into Suzanne's office. She said, do you want to do it? I said, Yes, she said, okay, 
that was it. And then it took a really, this was two years ago, mind you, and then it took a really long time to work out all the paperwork and um, we needed to get, we need diverse books on board and have an agreement with them, agreement with Cynthia. But um, it just felt like a real game changer. You know, I have really um, made it my mission to publish a lot of voices during my long career. And um, up until very recently, it was really hard. And um, it was sometimes very, very discouraging. It was discouraging to go into acquisitions with um, a book by a BIPOC author. Really, I think um, one of the things that changed that conversation was we need diverse books. When the organization started, um, it gave me ammunition to go into the meetings and to say, we need diverse books. And this is why I had the statistics about kids, about books, about how few books were on the shelves. You know, I looked at the work that the um, uh, Cooperative Children's Book Center in Wisconsin was doing. Um, which also had statistics that were, that were and still are very alarming. And um, it's, it's kind of a, it feels like a golden age that I've never really experienced. Um, that's, that's wonderful. And the fact that we are all here talking to you booksellers is, is so mind boggling to me and so wonderful. I, I can't even begin to tell you how, how grateful I am to, to be here. Um, Obviously, I would never have done this, been able to do this without Cynthia, who is Wonder Woman. I wonder how Cynthia does it all. Um, you know, my guide and everything. Um, you know, I'm not Native. I'm uh, Russian, Jewish, and Irish. And so I really um, have very little knowledge. You know, I'm trying to educate myself with every book. And um, with every author I work with, but I feel um, I have felt so embraced by the community. It's been so really um, heartening to, to see what has happened. We had a, um, Cynthia mentioned the educational part of what we do. So in August, we were supposed to have a uh, workshop or a, an intensive writer's workshop in Austin. And of course we couldn't do it in Austin. So we did it virtually for over four days in August. And actually what happened was we were able to have people from Alaska, from the Arctic Circle, from London, from Hawaii, from all over Canada, who maybe wouldn't have been able to fly to Austin. And we had more people than we would have had in person. And it was, it, it really felt like community building, you know? And I think that um, a lot of times native authors really haven't, had a chance with the bigger publishers like HarperCollins. And um, I, I feel like, you know, some of what we're doing is, is as education. And some of what we're doing also is just building this database of native illustrators who we're looking for all the time because we're trying to pair a native illustrator who would just be right for a project and has the right look. And um, with each different project we have, um, some really exciting picture books in the works. And um, we've signed some illustrators for those and are looking for new illustrators. We're working with new people and we're, we're willing to um, work with people who've never done children's books before and teach them. And, and I'm grateful to our, um, our art director and our designers because they're all really excited about this too. It just feels like this kind of family working together. That's incredible. It definitely feels like a special moment where, you know, I'm, I'm Filipino American and, you know, we're, we're starting to see books coming out of, you know, that are not just, you know, we, we love the small, small presses, but a lot of times they, they can't, you know, they don't have the capacity to do as many books um, or they can only do a first print. And then once it's gone, that's gone. Um, so I think this is so incredible to have, you know, a major publisher getting behind this. Um, and, uh, and would love to, to hear more about your um, work with We Need Diverse Books, because I know we've talked to, we've heard about and talked about the need for greater diversity, not just amongst the writers, but also amongst the publishers. And so um, it's really an, uh, amazing to have, um, you know, Cynthia in there um, 
advocating for, for writers. Sin, do you want to talk about the um, We Need Diverse Books connection? Yes, I was thinking about, really, I think um, it's probably best described as a partnership, right? And so We Need Diverse Books, as I said, they originated the idea and they're our umbrella organization for the workshop, the writing intensive. And so, for example, in August when we had the event, Danelle Clayton, who is one of their officers, came and she visited with the community. But also, it's one of many programs that they're offering. They have a mentorship program. I'm going to be one of the We Need Diverse Books mentors for the upcoming year. They have internships for folks in publishing their scholarship and some additional relief money right now. And underneath that umbrella, there is a native fund specifically, but also they do general work that is in support of folks from a variety of underrepresented and marginalized identity elements. So we're somewhat hand in hand and you'll see um, the We Need Diverse Books logo on Heart Drum titles as they come out. I'd also wanted to mention one of the things that I thought was a bit of an education for me. As a writer, when I've submitted manuscripts, I've always thought of it in terms of, will it be acquired because it's a good enough story? Did I do a good job as a writer? Maybe because we put this in our head, does a publisher like me? Um, is my momentum good? There are all these things that writers are very cognizant of. Something I'm more aware of on the other side is that there is also a bit of a personality or a theme to certain lines. So at Heart Drum, for example, we're very interested in stories that are really centered on na young Native heroes, particularly contemporary or very recent historical, so 20th century kind of historical. And even then, those are a very small percentage of the group, much more interested in fiction than nonfiction. And I think a lot of that is to sort of underscore the message that we have not only a past, which is very important to us, but also a present and a future. And that that was an area in which looking at the body of literature for young people and native representation that's where we really saw a need, was page turning stories that were reflective of kids today. Awesome, and I saw a lot of heads, I think Dawn and Brian and Christine, you were all nodding your heads vigorously when, when Cynthia was talking about like, we need contemporary stories, not just historical um, stories about the past. Yeah, definitely. I'll just jump in with my educator hat. Um, one of the things when I work with um, K-12 educators um, who are not Native is I say, okay, bring whatever book that you've been using. Um, and so then I say, okay, let's look at the verb tense, pick open any page. And so many times what, what comes out is that it will say Native people fished, Ojibwe people lived, in Minnesota, and and I'm like, okay, we need more representation out there because I'm Ojibwe, I live in Minnesota, I go to Target, you know, and so I think that that that's one of the um, one of the treasures, one of the foundations that is so key to heart drop. I love that you go to Target. We go, we all go to Target. <laughs> um, there was a question or a comment in the chat about um, the concept of being born out of rejection and how that's such an important lesson for our kids to learn to talk um, and wanted to see if you guys were um, had any thoughts about resilience and, and what it takes to, um, you know, both to be become a published author, um, but also to be a, a native person in the world today. I'll talk first if, um, if it's cool. I experienced a lot of rejection, uh, tons of rejection, actually. Um, I often say this and I find it to be very true that I experienced a hundred no's before I had my first yes. And that yes has changed my entire life. And actually really quick, I'm going to kind of fold this back into what we're talking about present tense and stuff. My actual initial drafts of Healer of the Water Monster was all present tense because I was tired of having people write natives in the past tense. Um, that didn't make, um, and so the entire book was like Nathan runs along this way and Nathan plays with his smartphone. So that was my initial draft and 
part of the reason why I was experiencing so many rejections was because of that awkwardness of writing in the present tense. And I had to rewrite my entire manuscript from scratch just to want get rid of that awkwardness. But, and I felt that by showing Nathan being a kid who is texting his friends with a smartphone and, you know, obsessing over the latest video game release is enough of a statement that kids live, that native kids live in our current times. Um, yeah, it's been five years that I've been working on this book alone and it's just, um, it's been wonderful, but also really fast. Um, since I did my revision for my thesis for my master's degree uh, in creative writing, it just, um, I got the agent, I got my agent, wonderful man, Dan, <laughs> love him. Uh, and about three months later, we got the book contract. So it's just been one yes after another, but it wasn't because, it was because of all those rejections of hearing no, no, that forced me to grow as a writer. And I feel that if I hadn't been declined as frequently as I had been, then I wouldn't have made uh, this book as as strong as I want it to be, as strong as it currently is, and a, as strong as I hope it will be for the mass market. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in too, because um, whenever I talk about my books, I always am very purposeful about saying this is my second published book, because I wrote and queried for three other full manuscripts before I can make this promise. And I can make this promise was, so it was the fourth book that I technically wrote from start to finish. But it was the first one to make it out into the world. And um, I have no real aspirations to go back and try and get those previous drafts um, sort of published because I think that in a way it was really me practicing my craft, right? And it was me learning how to write a full book um, and I'm actually very glad that none of them <laughs> went anywhere because I think that, um, they, again, they sort of were, uh, a completely different type of story than what I think I'm really best at. So, um, yeah, I definitely think that that's, I don't know anyone who had a, an easy time getting into publishing. Kind of no matter who you are, everyone has to really work hard at it and to keep um, keep kind of persisting through it because it is a very competitive industry and it's very um, subjective, it's so subjective, you know, about what people are looking for and what you how you want to sort of reach compromises in your own story. Um, before I signed with Rosemary, um, I did receive one editor. There was, there was some interest for I can make this promise once I signed with my agent and had gone through many, many drafts. Um, but there was this one editor, I remember, who was very interested in my voice and um, the, some of the history that I sort of got into but they asked me to essentially, they said that they would acquire the book if I kind of went through, completely changed everything, said it in the past from Edie's mother's perspective instead of Edie's. And um, they felt that would raise the stakes. They felt that that would make it a, place it closer to the action, I guess, <laughs> which, um, I could have gotten a book deal sooner, but I didn't want to do that. So um, for me, the intergenerational aspect was so important. For me, the contemporary perspective was extremely important. And for me, both of my books are, the whole point is to kind of create this contemporary story and to show these kids that are living right now and, um, how their past informs certain aspects of their present, but uh, you know that's not all they carry, and that's not all that they are. So yeah, definitely, 
I, I love that question because it's something I think about a lot about, um, you know, making sure that it's a contemporary story and sort of what all that means and um, not just acting like we only exist in the past. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just jump in and just say two, two, two things that I absolutely agree with. Uh, like Brian said, um, you know, a lot of rejections, uh, you know, my first one, it was a lot of rejections. Um, and, but I, I do think Native people, we are very patient. Um, I think that uh, we're in it for the long haul because we know that when we were growing up, we did not, we did not see ourselves represented. Um, as much as we need to. And then also I love what Christine said about, you know what, I was not willing to compromise. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love it because uh, with my draft, with, um, with my first JoJo book in the series, a lot of times I'll write something and I won't do an explanation. Um, and it's just like, for example, it's something um, like lip pointing. Native people, we don't point you with your finger. You, you do that. What donut do you want? that one and and so sometimes rosemary would say like what is this and i love it because heart drum they are letting us center our stories um and we don't have to explain it um sometimes it's okay if non-native people it's going to go over their head and so um i think that it was worth it for me to be rejected um for my first book to get to where i am now it, it was definitely it's worth it I love that. We're, we're lip, lip pointers in my family, too. <laughs> you know, I think we're all apprentices, no matter what we're doing over the course of our life. And writing is a wonderful way to unpack that experience. One of the reasons that I write such a range of stories is because it's a way to push myself to stretch and grow. A no is not necessarily a forever no. It might be a not yet. And it might be a not yet that's said with love as it pulls you forward. And I think it's important for all of us to look for that to hang on to that hope and that optimism, especially if we're going to be storytellers for young readers, especially now, but really always. Absolutely. Somebody said, I love that we're all apprentices. Um, and then I just wanted to share, um, somebody else, Gabriel, said that it's so heartening to see this imprint grow before our eyes and boldly go out into the world. I think that's, that's a great um, statement. Um, let's see, just checking to see if I'm missing any questions. Um, I did want to ask you guys, so as we have already started to talk about, um, you know, for um, Cynthia, I know that this is um, Jojo, or sorry, um, for Dawn, Jojo is the first in, in the chapter book. Um, are you guys... Can you guys talk a little bit about if you are working on an, uh, um, something new? Um, I, I remember um, I went to, you know, way back in the day when we could go to author events, um, I went to a, a bookstore in, in Los Angeles um, called The Rip Bodice, and one of the um, YA authors there, David Yoon, talked about how important it is if you're a writer to just, just keep writing because um, I think like Brian and um, Christine have said, you know, once you get that yes, which may take a long time, but once you get the yes, and then people are like, okay, what do you have next? <laughs> so I'm being the obnoxious person and asking what's up next. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll, 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 I'll be very cryptic. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's absolutely right. I think that there, there's momentum um, when you're given a yes. And I think like Christine said about, about this imposter syndrome, um, you know, I'm writing, uh, keep working, uh, living in the world of Jojo, working on the second one. And that's been, that's been really fun. <laughs> and then, um, and then just working on some, just some, some other, some other works. Um, yeah, I'm not really answering your question, but, <laughs> but it's, it's great. Um, I think there's not enough time in the day. Um, because a lot of us have a pesky day job <laughs> that that needs attention, but it's just my happy time to really think about um, writing for uh, for all children, for kids, but especially to really center the native characters. 
you can talk about the picture book, Dawn, even though nobody knows well. about it. I think it's okay. <laughs> All right, splashing news. It's safe with these folks here. <laughs> okay, um, so I am Ojibwe, um, Turtle Mountain Ojibwe. Um, and so I've always been intrigued by this word. It's Anin. Anin means it's a greeting, but it's actually translated into you're greeting somebody and you say, I recognize the light within you. Hmm. And so, um, so I, I, I kept thinking about this and I'm like, you know, somebody should really write a book about that. And, and you know, when no one does, a lot of times in creator, the universe says, um, tap to tap, Dawn, <laughs> that's you. So, um, and then also I've just been really intrigued about ways to live. And so um, many na tribal nations, um, indigenous communities around the world, we have ways to live. And so in the Ojibwe community, we have um, grandfather teachings about being brave, being humble. And so what I did is I almost was um, imagined a conversation with myself or with a child and letting them really say, um, letting them know, I mean, I see the light in you when others ignore but you look close to the earth to learn. And so it's really a picture book about going through um, and just acknowledging that there's different ways to know, different ways to learn, different ways to love and different ways to live. So, um, woo, we're uh, very excited to say that. <laughs> no official announcement yet. So thank you, Rosemary. That sounds amazing. I'll jump in. Um, as, as we discussed, Next up is Ancestor Approved Intertribal Stories for Kids, which features all of these amazing voices, plus many more. And then after that, I'm looking forward to the release of a middle grade novel called Sisters of the Never Sea. It is a decidedly indigenous, definitely gender empowered, modern retake on Peter Pan. I'm someone who's very interested in the conversation of books over time. Some of you may remember some years ago, if you're big Y folks who've been around a while, I wrote a series called Tantalize, which was sort of talking back to Abraham Stoker from a feminine, shall we say, point of view. And this is, um, it's fair to say that there's some native attitude in this and that J.M. Barry is probably sitting up paying attention wherever he might be wondering when he's going to get a hold of a copy to see how I have reinvented that world and sensibility. At the same time, the heart of it is really a family story. Our heroes are two stepsisters, uh, Wendy Darling, who's a white British girl, and Lily Roberts, who's of Muscogee Girl, which is my nation. They're stepsisters. They're living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the suburbs. When Peter and Belle show up, hijinks ensues, and they have to come together, and kids come together, and they build on a place of strength and understanding that's fully actualized and three-dimensional, and hopefully will make folks see a lot of these traditional, quote-unquote, classic canon dynamics in a new, fresh, and more authentic light. That sounds amazing. I'm super, super excited. I love, I love when books, when authors write books that are basically are, you know, talking in conversation, like you said, with um, classics or, or books that have been um, big inspirations to them. Did anybody else want to share? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I am so excited to read that. <laughs> I'm so excited to read all of these books. Okay. So um, for me, yes, yeah, so I already talked about the sea in winter. And I do have a short story along with everyone else in Ancestor Approved. I'm super excited about that one. Um, my other upcoming project this year is uh, I was lucky enough through Cynthia. Cynthia actually recommended me for this because she just goes around changing lives. <laughs> That's like what she does. Um, so um, I'm also going to be in the new She Persisted chapter book series, which is inspired by Chelsea Clinton's picture book, which um, so Chelsea Clinton's editorial team, they sought out 13 women to write early reader biographies that sort of expand on each of the women who are covered in that book. Um, so Sally Ride, Harriet Tubman, Ruby Bridges, 
I am lucky enough to be writing the early reader biography for Maria Tallchief, which is super significant for me. I did ballet for 10 years growing up, and I actually, that was how I first learned about Maria Tallchief, was this one ballet history seminar when I was like 10 or 11 years old. And um, I remember learning about her and learning that the first great American prima ballerina was a native woman <laughs> from the Osage Nation. And she grew up in Oklahoma and then had this like incredible life. Uh, she learning about her more through this process, doing this research has been some of the most fun. I, I love research in general, <laughs> I, uh, but this, this was just so special. And she really was just such an incredible person. And so I'm really excited to share her story for a sort of younger audience for that sort of grades one through three. Um, I'm really excited too for when it's safe to gather again to have events with those kids because I think it's going to be so much fun. Um, and yeah, she was just an incredible person. And so I'm really trying my hardest to do her justice. And that's the next thing that I can talk about. So yeah. That's huge. Congratulations. Okay, so I think we're starting to wind down. So I just wanted to ask you guys, I know we talked about um, uh, centering, you know, native characters and um, how exciting this is to have an imprint that is wholly focused on this. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, if you could share with us, you know, you, what books that you, um, that were really important to you in your reading life um, that, that did that for you? Um, This would be in our reading life when we were young? Young or, or you know, now, <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> I'll leave it broad. <laughs> I, I, I will play it safe and pick a childhood favorite simply because there are too many, written by too many dear and beloved friends to choose from. Uh, when I was a girl growing up, uh, my comfort book, the one that I returned to again and again was Witch of Blackbird Pong from, by Elizabeth George Spear. And it is a story of Kit who moves from Barbados to live with her aunt and uncle in Puritan New England and is eventually tried as a witch. She is a big reader and believes in a just and inclusive world, um, even though her, she is surrounded by folks who are not particularly bent that way herself. And she was a real, I think it's a bit of a study in courage for me. I also think that perhaps more than once on my cul-de-sac in Kansas. I thought that if I'd been living back there back then that I might have been tried as a witch too. So I really identified with her point of view and also um, just really loved it as an adventure. And one of the things that is really exciting to me when I'm looking at books is what is a book that kids are just going to fall in love with. Uh, there was a, a period of time when we thought about Native Lit in particular as books that could teach and every book with a Native character is going to do that because they're going to be packed with so many interesting themes and a cultural context and perspective, but also books that kids can't put down, right? Books that are real page turners. And so that's what I'm always longing for both as a reader and someone who's also looking for more books to bring out into the world. Awesome. I'm seeing a lot of love for Witch of Blackbird Pond in the chat. <laughs> So a book that meant a lot to me when I was growing up was Holes by Lewis Sacker. Mm -hmm. That is just such a layered and rich story. And I love how there's so many just sort of like funny and eccentric characters in it and really diverse characters and really, um, I love how it also taught me a lot about, you know, kind of through this fictional mystery slash history of the specific place that takes it that it's set in you know Camp Green Lake had this like really fascinating history as a town and um you know sort of touches on issues of race and on issues of sort of 
um, how people, their like desires were policed and all those different types of things is all wrapped up in this really fascinating, fun, memorable kids book. And um, so that's one that I always seem to turn to because it just did so much. And I remember turning to it time and again, same thing with the movie. It was just one of the like, one of my favorite books. And it always pops into my head with this question because I love the themes about justice and about uh, friendship and literally everything about it and how it all culminates. It was just, it's so good, so. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Um, I think as a kid, it wasn't one book, but a series, Goosebumps. Mm. <laughs> I would beg my mom to take me to Gallup every month at the beginning when Goosebumps were released because my cousins would leave their Goosebumps books at my grandparents' place. And my grandma, for a long time, when we were herding cows, didn't have... Um, running water electricity. So those books were my saviors from boredom. And I would reread, um, I think my favorite was The Barking Ghost because I, I really wanted a dog. <laughs> and the idea of a ghost puppy was like amazing. Um, but more recently, I think I'm really into Philip Pullman's uh, His Dark Materials. And it has been something I refer to when world building and you know setting a unique and empowered character in Lyra. But yeah, definitely Goosebumps as a kid. It, it saved me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and I would say for me, you know, I just, I read anything that I could get my hands on. I'm really bad about remembering like certain book titles. I'm like, um, but you know, as I became an educator and a parent myself and a co-director for Indian Education, you know, I really fell in love with um, things by Tim Tingle, Joe Bruchak, and of course. But you know, you know, thinking about um, visiting the Turtle Mountain Reservation in the summers, you know, one of my favorite storytellers, um, not a published author, but was my grandfather, my my Mushum. Um, you know, he was such a great storyteller, and that is just a huge aspect in Native culture. You know, we would. We would just listen to him and he was so animated with his words and and we would just like follow his story in hands like a great bird and we would see where the story would end um and it's so funny because my mom she, you know ever my mother i'm 50 years old but she she said um wow how did you become a writer we don't have any writers in the story and i said but we have storytellers I, you know, native storytellers, um, you know, I'm biased, but we're, I, I think we're the best, especially orally. So hopefully maybe, uh, oh, and I got really excited because I heard that um, the Ancestor Approved Anthology is going to, um, they're going to record the audio. So that's going to reach so many people, so many children. That's amazing. And I think that, that that's such an important lesson is that, that we all have, you know, stories to tell. And um, it's especially important for, for writers to write them down because once, you know, I'm, I've had this conversation with my mom about um, stories disappearing from our family because, you know, she didn't get the opportunity to ask um, her parents or her grandparents about something um, and, and what a loss that is for, for the rest of us. Um, there is a question. Um, somebody asked, Summer asked, um, I love hearing your native language as you introduce yourselves. Are any of your books being released in audio? I think I see Christine nodding. Yes, and Rosemary <laughs> just commented they all are. <laughs> awesome. Well, okay. That's news to me. <laughs> Surprise. Oh, well, yay. <laughs> I'm happy news for you. <laughs> I think that's going to be a, such a huge, um, as Dom said, like that, that introduces books to a whole new audience. And I think we've seen, um, especially during the pandemic, um, so many people um, listening to audiobooks um, when they couldn't physically get their hands on books or they couldn't get out of their house to get books. Um, so that's going to be so, so wonderful. Um, 
So we are almost out of time. I just wanted to um, say another quick thank you to um, Don Quigley, to Rosemary Brosnan, to Brian Young, to Christine Day, um, to Cynthia Lady H. Smith. Um, thank you so much. This is a fantastic um, imprint. Um, I'm seeing lots of comments about um, what a fascinating session this was. And um, somebody said it was a highlight of the show for them. So that's awesome. Um, love that. So thank you so much, um, all of you. And um, for you booksellers out there, uh, make sure to check out the Heart Drum imprint. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank for you being so here. much. You're no, so thank, you. thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you. I think